Welcome to another episode of Debased on a True Story. Today, we're going to talk about Whitley Strieber's communion. And uh, taking the show here uh, from here will be Blake Smith and Karen Stolzno. Go for it, guys. Greetings. Hi. So, yeah, this is uh, one of our many projects uh, under the, the, the auspices of, of Monster Talk. So, um, yeah, we've looked at a number of other movies so far, what Amityville and The Exorcist, um, The Hills the Have Eyes, Changeling, have eyes. The Changeling. Yeah. yeah. And so we thought we've been looking at a lot of uh, horror movies and, and stuff like that. So we thought it's time to look at UFOs and spaceships and aliens. Not yeah, to but, say that yeah, this ahead. isn't horror. No, no, I, I think there's elements that are horror. horrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I guess, in, in, you know, depending on your experiences, I think watching the movie can be its own kind of horror. Um, but I think and reading what, the book, <laughs> right? It, it's a, it, the communion uh, phenomenon. And I don't mean the weird stuff that happened in the book. I mean, the meta discussion about the success of the novel and of the film to some extent. Um, it's, it's really one of those, the thing that makes it scary is that it's supposed to be a true story. I think if it weren't a true story, I don't think it's that powerful of a story, but when it's supposed to be true, then suddenly it becomes quite chilling. Yeah, it might We're finding be that to be a running theme though, aren't we? yeah yeah for you know sure. i mean like when we look at amityville and when we look at you know um you know the hills have eyes it's uh suddenly more terrifying when you think that this is real yeah so yeah. and then this yeah this is no different i agree um so uh, the movie came out in uh, 1989 and that was based on the 1987 book and i think it's interesting that there are parallels between whitley streber or striver I, i've grown up saying striber uh, and communion, and to me, L. Ron Hubbard, the fact that he was a science fiction writer turned guru or god, uh, I just think it's interesting that here was Whitley writing about horror, and then suddenly there's this book that is, uh, I guess, an autobiography, uh, autobiographical story about his personal experiences, and it just, to me, smacks a little bit of, of Ron Hubbard, uh, having having that background writing about something and suddenly oh you're, you're experiencing these things your spiritual things yourself right and, and and he was a horror writer probably most famously of the of the book in the movie wolfen um which is about sort of an urban wolf slash werewolf uh, pack it's an interesting film and book. Well, he was already famous by the time right he was having these experiences so so writing a story about a, let's let's talk about this he, he i think there's a really common perception largely because if you take a look at the cover of the book uh this looks like a book about aliens right yeah but yep. but if you actually read the book he never really calls them aliens he calls them the visitors and mm -hmm, talks right. about them in terms of an intelligent non-human species mm -hmm. and i think he perfectly uh strategically tapped into this rising ufo culture around abductions and the conspiracies to hide them uh and, and made a story that's written like a horror story mm -hmm. allegedly true but at, at just about the perfect time to cash in and i i think <laughs> what, and that's a very cynical uh reduction of, of his book here but I mean, I think people people look at the book and they maybe say, maybe it's just a coincidence. Yeah, maybe it's a coincidence. <laughs> maybe I mean, I mean, everybody wants to do that. I mean, like if you're a writer, you want to like have this moment where you perfectly wrote your book at the time when the world was ready for. It. I mean, you right. want to be Dan Brown writing about the Da Vinci Code, <laughs> right? You don't. I mean, the the people who wrote the Holy Blood, Holy Grail. They made some money, but not like Dan Brown made money, you know, so like the, right. the timing matters, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. it really does. Well, another thing about that timing is 1987 was the year of the harmonic convergence. And which was, that huge. was like a big harmonica convention in St. Louis, right? 
that uh yes led by yes. bob dylan yeah. yeah bob dylan and a bunch of hobos it was awesome right right and uh yeah it was it was a sight to hear ANSI. um <laughs> nobody had the same key uh harmonica so it was kind of a mess um so not that harmonic at all but uh oh. the thing is is that the harmonic convergence was really huge in the ufo community um it was believed that the alignment of the planets and various other aspects of it were going to bring us to an elevated level of consciousness so we would be able to commune with mm -hmm. our visitors uh, more effectively. So the fact that he was able to release this book in 1987 is another interesting coincidence, um, mm -hmm. very harmonic, uh, definitely. Well, I think that the name is interesting too, because I remember it mentioning to a couple of people that we we're going to be talking about communion for the next the based on a true story episode and they were like oh you're talking about like catholic communion or, or what yeah so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I do think it's interesting that he chose that that term and is there any specific reason that he chose that outside of the, the usage that matt just gave us uh, is there more insight in the book into why he calls it a communion yeah. The, in the very end of the book, there's a lot of discussion about communion being about this relationship between him as an experiencer and these alien intelligences and the way that they're able to talk to each other. Um, you know, I, I guess what we should do, uh, well, I mean, I, I would think that uh, most people have heard of communion, but it's possible mm -hmm. that they haven't. So let's give a, a, a little brief rundown of what this story is about. Right. If you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at it. This is uh, about events that happened in 1985, uh, in October, right around Halloween and around Christmas time. Um, and Strieber uh, was a successful horror writer living in New York City, but he had a cabin up in the Catskills um, where he and his wife and son would go to vacation. And this story is also told in the movie. There's a few differences and we'll get into that. But okay. while he's uh, visiting in October and then again in uh, December, right around Christmas time, he has some strange experiences of somebody perhaps entering the cabin or maybe some lights coming on. He's not really sure. He thinks maybe somebody came, but he doesn't really remember exactly what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. Over time, these memories uh, start to plague him. He has a lot of... Uh, problems where he thinks maybe something was going on he doesn't really remember exactly what ultimately he ends up getting connected with the alien abduction community and gets uh, hypnotically regressed to go back mm -hmm. and re-experience that evening and discovers to his horror that what actually happened was that intelligent visitors from somewhere came into his home kidnapped him took him out into the woods took him onto some sort of craft um anally probed him and generally experimented with him in a very uncomfortable fashion before returning him to his home and telling him he was not going to remember this and he shouldn't be talking about it right so is this the first instance that we know of of the anal probe because that this is, is just... this is it, I I am not familiar with any case before this with the anal probe. This is a, effectively case zero for the cultural <laughs> understanding of the anal probe as part of the uh, uh, experience of uh, abduction. Before and we'll this, discuss I mean, that in the the movies exactly. The movies well, and a bit later as well. And I, I have to say, so like in preparing for this episode, we uh, all did a lot of research. We watched the movie, read the book. I also got this uh, book called The Report on Communion uh, by Ed Conroy, which has a lot more background on it. I listened to subsequent interviews with Streber. Streber has continued to be involved with the paranormal radio world and the UFO radio world. He yes. took over, Sun, Sunday nights used to be a show called Dreamland, hosted by Art Bell. Like he would mm -hmm. host Coast to Coast AM all week. And then on the weekends, on Sunday nights, he would host Dreamland, which would be a little bit of a different format. And ultimately he gave the Dreamland show over to Streber, who continues to run it to this day. And uh, still has the 
same theme music and everything. So even though so, Art Bell's no longer with us, so. Is he continuing to have these visitations and these nightmares, are they still happening? It's complicated. He continues to have experiences with the visitors. Uh, he was married to a woman named Anne in this book and talks a lot about her. Uh, she died. The, from she does. A she, while ago, she, didn't yeah, she? Spoiler, she does die. <laughs> Not in the book or the Far movie, feet. but she does eventually pass. <laughs> and that's when things, in my opinion, get super weird because this is when Streber starts talking about and it really, these go back to, he had a book called The Communion Letter. So after the success of Communion, he had hundreds of thousands of people send letters to him. And he and his wife went through them in big chunks. And they put together a book called The Communion Letters, which deals with a lot of the uh, sort of weird experiences people who uh, had read his book wanted to share. Um, and one of the things that happens in there is people talk about, having seen dead relatives in conjunction with being abducted. And so over time, again, he never says what these things are. It's obviously to anybody from the outside, if you haven't read his book, clearly these are aliens. I mean, aliens, look, yeah. look at the picture. It's clearly an alien. Mm -hmm. But that's not what Strieber says. Strieber calls them uh, intelligences. Uh, and he does not say where they're from. And he definitely believes some, well, very difficult to say what people believe. He proposes that it all has something to do with the continued existence of human consciousness. Um, he becomes good friends with Jacques Vallée. Vallée is kind of famous for saying that UFOs, maybe they're not aliens. Maybe they are fairies. Maybe they're tied to the, this thing that people have been experiencing for thousands of years. Is, is he uh, related to Bruce Valanche? Um, they have uh, very similar uh, V's in their names. I thought so. But yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> why do you think he doesn't use the A word then? I know um, why. <laughs> why. Why do you, do you think, think it's that he's trying? His wife. His wife. Well, she... his wife definitely told him in the first book, don't call him aliens. Don't That's call him aliens. true. Yeah. 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 Okay. But... I was going to say, does this let it lend it uh, scientific credibility somehow to, to no. not use that term? I think it lends it vagueness, and vagueness can really be powerful. Sure. Yeah. Um, and she, manipulated, she, yeah. I think her idea was that it was more artistic uh, this way, to have that bit of, of um, you know, I, I don't want to say mystery to it, because there is no mystery. But mm -hmm. uh, it just, you know, for people that have an aversion to the word alien, uh, whether, you know, from skepticism or from their own experiences, uh, him not using that, she felt, was a better way to go. So. I have a I have a, a personal saying that I like uh, that I've been saying since college, which is there once was a man from Nantucket. Ambiguity <laughs> is the devil's Not that lingerie. One. <laughs> Ambiguity is the devil's lingerie. I'm sure you use that, that, that all the time. That is a good I do. one. I do. I do. I do. But because <laughs> it, you you it can hide all kinds of things, and it can make something that's really terrible seem super sexy. So um it's just <laughs> a, ambiguity is it's like sexist. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, hey. It's like I. I, I don't know. I mean, the devil could be a beautiful lady. It could be a beautiful man. I don't, I'm not judging. I mean, well, like, yeah. supposedly what, sometimes. Uh, in, in the book at all, does he, I don't think this is treated in the movie, but in the book, do they refer to themselves? Do they have some kind of exonym for what we are? You know, he, here we are, we're great. I don't remember. I, I know he talks about, uh, there's different ones, like there's different uh, types Species. of entities. And we'll yeah. get around to that too. That's treated in the movie. It's, the the yeah. sort of the, my recollection is the sort of the one wearing coveralls. Uh, it looks like a, well, to me personally, this is me. And maybe you could throw a graphic up in the video, but. We will, yeah. To me, the ones that are wearing the coveralls and have the big head look an awful lot like the uh, the Red Queen from the illustrated um, uh through the looking glass oh, uh, by mm -hmm. Lewis Carroll. That's an interesting comparison. Yeah, yeah they yeah. do look a bit comical. They're not very scary. Yeah, I mean, they have this the... enormous giant head on their normal size body. It, it just reminds me of that. I don't know if that was intentional or not. Yeah, that's a little bit of a cross cool. between that and a blue Oompa Loompa. Um, <laughs> yeah. Loompa Loompas, yeah. Well, blue like if you could hold up the cover again, because I remember seeing this, uh, the, the cover when I was a kid and and being petrified by this. Oh, yeah. It such no, an super iconic... Scary eerie image and uh i guess we're going to talk more about the alien species in the progression too but is this the first usage of this 
face and this type? Did, did he is is he the first person to? No. No, he he's definitely not. Um, and and, and this, this look at me. Am I? Am I? Uh, just oh, like just you. Like just like, <laughs> just like <laughs> you. Sister. Um, I'd yeah. say one of the big things. You know, that's supposed uh, according to uh, Willie. That's a, a female um on the cover there so and and you can totally tell female. because uh she's got a nose uh often the grays <laughs> don't have a nose like that um and often the grays are more gray and uh she's not so and gray. Yellow, are you saying yeah. f- females yeah. nose more exactly <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> yep yep uh, exactly so uh, but yeah we, should... we if, if you want i can bring up uh joe nichols timeline and uh, he kind of shows where these types of aliens started appearing. Mm-hmm. You know, other than it's wearing a, lo- looks to be a nice fur coat with a hood, 1951 uh, looks like a, a time when that sort of face appears. And then 1954, well, I... we see it again. We see it again in 1961. See it again in 1967. Um, so it has popped up quite a few times. 1975. Um, you know, 1986. Uh, so it's you know sectoid. Yeah, and then it's really hanging out through the '90s. Um, it's yep. the main so sometimes they're alien. Gray, and sometimes they're green. Uh, yeah, they can be green. They can be gray. They can be, you know, uh, human flesh colored. Uh, it's it's really varies, and their size varies as well. And sometimes they're but little, that, and sometimes that, they're giant. Right. Right. But that guitar right. pick shaped head with the almond shaped eyes um, is kind of just iconic. And the thing is, is mm-hmm. Uh, especially when they, they started calling them Spielbergs because of uh, <laughs> the, the whole uh, close encounters. So, yeah, I mean, this is this has been kind of an iconic alien for a long time. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think because we've had it in our consciousness, because it's been shown so many times throughout, you know, since the 50s, um, that when that face showed up on the cover, uh, that was a yeah, that really struck a chord with so many of us. It really right. did. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a, I, between this and Close Encounters, it really sort of created a, a really very, very available cultural template for what a uh, alien encounter is supposed to be like. So sure. very, yeah, sure. the very strong suggestion well, was there. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think uh, we should start talking about the movie now anyway, and, um, and in comparison to the book as well and uh, I think the the movie is really interesting uh, I think that what makes it bearable is uh, Christopher <laughs> Falcon <laughs> he's just so strange and uh, I, I think yeah we should talk a little bit about his uh, his performance uh, in the movie and um, certainly his interaction with Whitley as well outside well, of that yeah I mean the the, the director uh, of the movie called uh, Watkins' uh, approach jazz acting, and uh, that he would just try all kinds of, of different things all the time. And I wanted to ask the the Whitley that's in the movie: how different is he from the Whitley in the book? Um, the thing about the movie, I, I think, is Walken. I think it's hard to say that Walken is not being performative. Like everything about Walken's performance in that film seems like he's crafting a. Right. And I don't know. I mean, I, I gather from Whitley Strieber's friends and stuff, he's quite a character himself, mm-hmm. but it feels I, like I did my mustache like uh, this Walken today is, is cranking the weird up to 11. <laughs> yeah. No, I did my mustache in, like this in, today sort of for, like the, for the in homage to him. Well, yeah, because of the scenes where he uh, would see a version of himself that was like the magician and yes, stuff. Yes, that's, oh, that's that's right. yes, 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 yeah, he did. Hair, mm-hmm. back. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. think it, it's his acting is just really interesting, and he has shades of David Bowie with wearing the makeup and the androgyny, and uh, he also reminds me a little bit of some of the actors in uh, Clockwork Orange. So it's uh, interesting performance but again i don't know how similar it is to um the 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 reality whatever that is yeah Yeah. well so here's the i I found this interesting in conjunction with the release of the film there was an audio book um that was narrated by roddy mcdowell that came out uh contemporaneous to the film and there was also a made for tv documentary about the Whitley Strieber communion experience. And it's also hosted by Rodney McDowell. 
And in there, you see interviews with uh, Strieber and a lot of his contemporaries and other uh, people in the contactee uh, community. Mm -hmm. And it feels like in that time period, when they're doing promotion for the film, that Strieber is excited about this movie coming out, and he seems very positive about it. Now, that being said, if you listen to interviews with him uh, 10 years later, uh, in like 2007, he's not happy with that film at all. He's upset about it, and he says of it that Christopher Walken's performance was entirely meant to be a parody and a mockery of his own life. Uh, I don't know what happened in those 10 years because literally the, the comments probably from the public and people. Yeah, saying maybe, that it maybe, yeah, silly. maybe it's, 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 is it a dodge? Is it a way to explain why the film didn't perform that well? I don't know. I, I like, I don't have like a, uh, a real good view into why he changes his tune, but boy, he changes it hard though. He well, that's, you know, the thing too. is at the time it didn't do that. Poorly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it it, it boosted his book sales. Uh, suddenly, he's uh, this uh, interstellar celebrity, so to speak. But you know, as they were filming it, Whitley said to Christopher Walken, "You know, you're kind of making me look crazy." And Christopher I think it was said, in particular, "I think it was in particular the scene where he was trying on the masks, trying on the the, the alien masks." Yeah, yeah. And uh, Christopher Walken said to him, "You know, if the shoe fits." oof and i think that's a brilliant <laughs> quote you know that christopher walken thought he was crazy um yeah. and yeah. so he just let himself go when he played this role and i, I think it's beautiful uh, it makes me wonder because there is so much christopher walken in the role oh yeah how much did we lose of of whitley um and and so i so i don't know i mean it's hard to say you know when we're looking at the based on a true story you know how much of this was performance art uh when we get down to it and how much of it for was Whitley's of story yeah for yeah both of them really but uh <laughs> well, what, what i was gonna say one, one thing that happens and this is true for any film that's based on a book is things in the film typically get streamlined in order to make them fit translate well screen. right yeah so what's two different visits to the cabin in the book kind of get merged into a single experience where they've got the other couple with them. Um, and that's Whitley's real life friends. I want to say, in, this didn't come across with the casting, but they were supposed to be like very fitness people. Um, the, the guy is supposed to be like a, a professional athlete with like martial arts skills and stuff. And it's played by the guy that plays There's the one on our man. Yeah, it's like that's that's the one our man from the uh the, the fugitive. Uh and hold on, I lost it. all these all these asses got me distracted. So <laughs> uh, I I had a cohesive thought and now something's wrecked up. Um oh, no, no, so no, <laughs> no, but seriously, um so that all got merged into one event. And then the other big difference, and I, you just, I think you actually watched the film more recently than me. I watched the movie like three months ago and then read the book like three weeks ago. So I should have done it maybe closer together because now I can't remember. Um, in the movie, the movie ends with them like walking around, like uh, Whitley and his wife walking around in an art gallery, if I remember correctly, having some sort of philosophical conversation about the meaning of the visitations right and i think that's filling in for the last sort of third of the book being whitley going i don't know what this means maybe it's this maybe it's that maybe these things are from another planet maybe these things are from the future maybe they're us maybe they're from another dimension like he just he like he releases he, himself only... from responsibility yeah it sounds like yeah, well, no, I mean, like, I, I don't know what happened, you know, so. Well, for uh, all of the, this uh, wisdom and knowledge, especially from this this female uh, matriarch character, uh, it's just amazing that they didn't communicate to him exactly what was going on. But I'm just wondering, uh, if in the movie, it seems like the these things or these visitors are attached to the, the house or the cottage. Uh, they don't seem to really follow him back to his apartment in manhattan i think at one point he does they hint at it yeah 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 but is this is is 
are these things in some way or these creatures in some way attached to the, the cottage no uh, or is here's, it here's where it gets, well, i mean they are in a sense because in the book he ends up bringing uh either in the book or one of the friggin many 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 interviews i heard with him he <laughs> ends up bringing a group of other uh, uh abductees it's sort of like a mini conference at his cabin and they all have weird experiences it reminds me very much very much of the amityville horror uh let's have a seance there and then like you know the people right. watching it see nothing but the people experiencing it say they had all kinds of crazy experiences stan romanek um, followed this exact same thing when uh he was uh, trying to convince people he did the same thing so he would invite every paranormal group he could find yeah to yeah. bring to his house yeah. and then yeah, he really up. did seem to use that as a, a template for his experiences That's interesting and i i like i like the fact that you're thinking of it in these sort of strategic terms because i i i just thought it was like oh they're building a community but maybe that's a more reasonable you bring in the people most likely to have experiences and then guess what they do have they experiences. have experiences yeah, yes exactly yeah, it's like yeah like uh an indoctrination in a sense like a religious yeah. thing but uh what i want to comment upon is that uh it's interesting that you said that he brought all of these people to this cottage and and it really embraced those uh, other experiences or abductees because in the movie he kind of rejects he starts going to therapy and he uh i think they're very uh uh they, they don't initially welcome him because they think that he could be somehow a threat to them or he's a, he's a writer and uh so they they don't immediately embrace him but he really yeah. does seem and to I reject the idea of of therapy at first and and other contactees like oh i'm not one of them Right. And I, I actually, I thought that was, that worked better in the movie than I think how things really played out in the book. Um, one more thing to answer your question about the cabin, though. In the book, something very specific happens that answers that mystery of, is this tied to the cabin or is it tied to him? And that is, he's doing his hypnotic regressions. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the doctor's like, I want to go back to the cabin. I want to go back to this date. And instead of going back there, he's suddenly on a train ride with his father in like the 1950s. And he's okay. having an abduction experience there and his father's part of it. So basically it, it's revealed that this has been following him around his whole life and he didn't know right. about it. So, right. um, well, I think, uh, yeah. yeah, in the, in the movie, they implied that his son this is passed on to his son, like mm -hmm. it's some kind of gift almost to be able to, to be aware of these uh, visitors. Uh, and, and they don't talk about his father at all. But yeah, it, it seems like from interviews that we've seen uh, that this is something passed down from his father and maybe even his grandparents. And it's just kind of following the, the male line in the family and that it's a, a kind of gift or he's chosen somehow. And, and he does, he and has I, implied that he has chosen. And that's one of the things uh, th that I'm looking at, because if you don't know the answer to something, it's great to say, I don't know what's happening here. It's, it's a good thing to, to take that stance. But if you're also going to take the position of, I'm the chosen one who's going to help humanity make better contact with these beings, um, I, I think it's really shirking responsibility to then go, I don't know what's going on here he's telling yeah. two sides of the same story and it's doesn't doesn't work for me right no he's definitely trying to leave it open and so he never has to uh one way of viewing this might be he never has to um dismiss any hypothesis because he accepts them all as plausible right. so right. if you like aliens well you're good to go here because he'll cover that but if you like mm -hmm. ghosts or other dimensions or future humans you're okay beings. there too come on yeah. in everyone's welcome because i'm not mm -hmm. going to explain any of this um <laughs> so yep. uh with him saying that this is something that's been handed down through his family what's the significance of these visitors of well, not the visitors but his uh friends who stayed at the cottage and had some kind of experience too and did his wife ever see these things I don't, she, under hypnosis in the first book, she basically says that she's not allowed 
to talk about what happened to her like under hypnosis she sees i'm not i've been told not to say and she she basically endorses whitley's experiences but says she can't really comment on because she's basically been blocked out of being able to release all her information due to these uh hypnotic blocks from the visitors um maybe it was a marketing thing well i mean yeah (laughs) there can only be one chosen one so true yeah yeah he ultimately so like we talked okay he hears a radio interview, I think, with Bud Hopkins is how he originally gets involved in the abduction community. He's had these weird nightmares. He doesn't know what's going on. He hears an interview with Bud Hopkins. Bud Hopkins and uh, John Mack are in the... There's, there's a couple other people, Jerome Clark. There's, there's a few people who are like around this culture of abductions at this time, uh, including one I'm not going to get into because of how that played out. But... Um, he ends up reaching out to Hopkins and says, I want to know more about this. Can you tell me more? Can you get me? So ultimately Hopkins tries to get him to get hypnotized and he refuses to let Hopkins interview him largely because Hopkins is not a doctor. Doc Hopkins is an artist. And so he gets, uh, he gets in touch with a psychiatrist or a psychologist rather named, um, uh okay keel no no not, not keel we just talked about this too yeah i keep forgetting his name donald klein sorry i keep thinking of keel oh. because john klein john is the name of the john keel character in the mothman prophecies movie that's why i keep keel and klein keep whirling around in my right, brain right this is yeah. the bye bye miss america pie guy exactly <laughs> right not the answer so <laughs> so he ends up uh getting hypnotized and and like unlocks all these memories for whatever purposes but since this time like in other words since communion came out he made a ton of money and sold a lot of books and when i say a ton of money i mean i know it was a like a more than a million dollars uh in the 87 period but then he wrote subsequent books and then they themselves were also super successful now transformation and there were several of them there was a bunch but he did an interview in 2007 with art bell when art bell had switched from doing terrestrial radio to doing satellite radio and we could put a link to this in our show notes but during that interview he's complaining and he said that like he was making lots of money and everything was very successful until south park and south park did an episode where cartman gets an anal probe and as soon as that and that's happened, actually the name of the episode it, it literally is it turns out that is literally episode one season one of south park and according to streber the success of that episode that one single episode completely undermined his ability to sell books and he went from being a new york times bestseller to basically nobody because everybody thought anal probes were a joke now well in his defense he says he we said, didn't think this, it before yeah well many people made jokes about it but now it was like no no really they're making a lot of jokes but but he points out that hey if i'm telling the truth you know they're basically mocking me for being raped right, right? Yeah, which i've is, heard which, him say that in an interview yeah, yeah and it's like which is sobering right you know it it is but yeah. uh i remember years ago it was either jeff peckman or stan romanek or both of them who criticized mm-hmm. me for writing about little green men and saying that i was you know, racist uh, the, yeah i was racist and prejudiced against other species because mm. i used that very common term i i think uh it, it's interesting in that uh whitley is is taking a real world problem a real world social issue and uh, that he's kind of pasting that onto his you know, potentially imaginary experience uh, to, to, I think, just lend credence to his theories and, and to give it credibility as well. So it's, it's interesting how we, we're seeing that happen a lot within that, that community to take us seriously, uh, these comparisons to racism and to, to, rape, and to rape and sexual yeah. harassment. Yeah, and that's that is that is scary because he can give all of the same arguments. 
you know, believe the victim and, and you know, all those things. And yeah, uh, victim blaming. And uh -huh. so it is. It's and I very, guess we, we should talk about a, that. It's a difficult then. roadblock he's thrown up. Oh, yeah, the anal probe. That's a, uh, you um, know, let's, uh, let's talk the, about that. In the movie, and uh, I mean, like you were talking about South Park, I think it's mm -hmm. parodied, parodied in lots of other um, areas of popular culture too. Matt, you showed me something from Adult Swim. There was a yeah, I'll, I'll that bring scene that one was up replayed. I was just going to um, show this really quickly first. So yeah, this is that area. And you just don't know what he's in for at this point. <laughs> Yeah, Maybe and when, do. the way that thing comes out of the wall and has a life of its own. Please do not be alarmed. We are about to engage the nozzle. Please do not move while the nozzle is engaging. Moving will disrupt calibration of the nozzle. Please wait while we calibrate the nozzle. Please do not look away from the nozzle. Why are you walking so funny, Cartman? In the, the movie, it's not it's not mocked. I mean, he's taking it seriously and he's yes. scared and he's wondering what's going on and he feels violated. So uh, yeah, it's not not exactly a mocking, but I can see how I mean this is just just become intrinsically tied in with. Uh, experiences and contactees the the idea of anal probes <laughs> right absolutely and and then once that got into the the sort of the uh the consciousness of the the public um that became canon you know in a sense now this is just what happens when you're abducted. Yeah, if you yeah if you have a visitation if you're an experiencer then you've had an anal probe yep I mean, we don't really you know handle that i mean it's it's interesting the Part of me wants to say, oh, well, you know, I was there, but this sounds awfully familiar. This sounds like uh, sleep paralysis. This sounds right. like uh, that sort of uh, hypnagogic or hypnopompic experience. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the things about that would be uh, those are frequently associated with sexual experiences. Um, right. And... Yeah. Uh, what like it or not um the anal probe uh fits more into the sexual experience than it does into the actual scientific approach i mean yes people do have proctology exams people do have cameras stuck up their butt but uh this doesn't i mean like for another species to come here i don't know why they would pick the anal probe is how they're going to get information from Whitley and his body. I, it seems like there would be other ways, uh, you know, he's well, tied that, that into cattle mutilations. I mean, you know, when you yes. get down to it, the stuff that they're getting all their vast information about us right. from is strange. Yes. Yeah, it, it really brings is. A it really new is. meaning to invasive species. It does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does make me think of the group therapy scenes in communion in the movie and uh, the, the experiences that some of the people are talking about really do have shades of sleep paralysis. And uh, what was disturbing to me were the experiences that some of the women had had, that they had had, uh, a, they'd been pregnant and then suddenly they'd had a miscarriage or the baby wasn't there anymore. So I guess to justify claims of alien hybrid children, uh, but there were you know, certainly these stories of something being there and then suddenly it's gone our experiences of, of rape or uh, harassment and of, of some kind um, really seems to to come into these experiences a lot. Um, but again, you've got that kind of communal reinforcement to uh, aspect where people had experiences like this and oh, now it can be explained. This is uh, an alien visitation. I I've had this experience too. And instead of looking for a natural explanation a scientific ex explanation like sleep paralysis uh, i think a lot of people enjoy the idea of thinking that they're special somehow and that they're a chosen one or a contactee uh that they have you know some kind of that they're special in some regard yeah absolutely and it does feel a lot like um 
that Strieber's coasting more and more towards spiritualism and enlightenment and that sort of new age uh, side of the aisle. He's not, nothing about this book says, here's concrete material that you can test and analyze for a scientific and rational worldview. Everything feels quasi spiritual, even right here at the beginning with, with communion. But since communion, he's continued to write more and more books that sort of push over into that other side towards philosophy and religion. Um, and, and that seems not, to be yeah. very common in these types of uh, alien abduction stories. They start yeah. out with fear and terror. And then as soon as we, you know, as soon as we get an understanding of what these aliens are trying to do, um, and that that I'm chosen to 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 help raise consciousness and all this kind of stuff, uh, and then the the people coming to him, you know the the communion letters and everything, it, it's they are worshiping him, and yeah. that is an addictive drug. Oh, I really bet. Addictive. I mean, I wouldn't mm-hmm. know, but I bet. You know, oh, so. I know all about it. <laughs> uh, so, but they're but, at this point they're just sorry. Well, I was going to say he also partnered with uh, Jeffrey Kripal. Um, who is a religious studies professor who's done a lot of work um, that seems to be geared towards undermining uh, a materialist, rational, science-based worldview. He he really seems to hate that worldview. And so he partnered with Strieber for a book called The Supernatural, A New Vision of the Unexplained in 2016. But even more telling to me is uh, Whitley's most recent book is called Jesus, a new vision. Now, is that uh, like a Jesus? Or is that <laughs> Jesus? Exclamation. Yeah, well, see, how, here's, how is here's what it says. It says, a new vision is at once a magisterial work of scholarship and a completely new approach to the meaning and message of Jesus. It comes at a time when the Western world is divided between a declining number of believers in Christian doctrine and an ever-increasing number of people who feel that Jesus was nothing more than a religious zealot who was executed for the crime of sedition. What if neither approach is right? What if Jesus really did perform miracles, including the resurrection, but that this says not that he was a deity, but he was exercising human powers, which are buried within us all, which we do not suspect are there. Oh, boy. If you get your vibrations just right, you too can have the power of Jesus. But that's an old, you know, an older theory. That is a very, very much an older theory that even, you know, was touched on with spiritualism. Yeah. um and uh yeah it's it's and that's a, a great easy one to jump on and that's that's the thing is so much yeah. of this is just so easy to you know to to ride the, t- the coattails of of right. all these other uh movements yeah. that have happened mm-hmm. yeah i i it's suspicious i mean to me it feels a lot like uh someone who is again talk about gravy trains the mm-hmm. Science doesn't know everything, get rid of the orthodoxy, down with the academics, you know, that kind of approach, yeah. even coming from within academia like Kripal, I think these are people who have realized that there is money to be made by saying mm-hmm. that science is an orthodoxy and just needs to be overturned for the new paradigms to take effect and lead us on into a shining new age of higher vibrations, my brothers. <laughs> right. So Right, yep, yep. Uh, and there are just so many different characters that we could talk about here. Matt just mentioned Mac, and uh, we've been talking about characters like uh, David M. Jacobs uh, mm. and Stan Romanek too. So I don't know if you want to talk about any of these kinds of people and their involvement in this or their, their parallels that well, we've taken on yeah, the mantle. There, there, there's, there's so much to talk about with, with both Stan Romanek and David M. Jacobs, because um, I've had uh, run-ins with both of them separately, and both of them uh, I ended up in screaming matches with, so it's kind of interesting. But uh, th- one of the interesting things is with Stan Romanek, he is following the template, but he's he's following the template of many he's different things. He's deviated a little bit, but... Well, uh, but, but he only deviated into a different template, is no really deviance. all he's done. <laughs> well, yeah, and he, yeah, the, he went complete deviant in the end, and, uh, you know, is now a... Uh, on the uh, sexual predator list so um the the thing is uh he he did all these same things that 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 uh, whitley did he did all the same things decades in fact later. He, he believes that you know he woke up one morning and was wearing this uh this this uh sort of nightgown and he believes that it it is betty hill's nightgown um devil's lingerie devil's lingerie <laughs> oh, yes oh wow boy that came full circle um <laughs> 
but uh, you know, so he's kind of gone down the line on all these these things. You know, he's had the kind of the MIB chasing him, and he's had you know the the government conspiracies trying to silence him, and all, all these different things on things. his computers. Yes, he's hidden uh, kitty porn on his computer. Yeah, Stan Romanek is uh, you know. He, he's the guy who went and he read all this stuff. He, he claims, of course, he knew nothing about any of it, but he was smart enough to memorize the Drake equation for his uh, first hypnotherapy session so he could write it down in, um, you know, under hypnosis. And then, you know, do, do you guys know much about the Drake equation? Yes. That, that it is no, nothing but it's, it's variables. The entire boring. equation is variables. There's no real numbers in the Drake equation. So it's up to you to plug in those numbers to mm. get your answer. So he has all of the variables written down. And then he says times 100. Ooh. If you know anything about algebra, that means nothing. Because you've got no numbers plugged in anywhere else. So times 100 means nothing. So if the aliens gave him that, the aliens are dumbasses um, that don't hey, understand uh, algebra Romanek either. Was not, Romanek was not built in a day. <laughs> so oh, boy is that the truth boy is that the truth but uh so yeah there's there's so many holes in his stories but the thing in his story but the thing is is i uh, found out who this hypnotherapist was and i went and found out where she got her license because you know you tend to start doubting the credentials of a lot of these people involved uh so i found the school she went to i enrolled and went and got my license as well. And I found out during the course of all my training that uh, regressions like this are not recommended because they never bring out the truth of anything. You can do it as a bit of theater if somebody needs to work out some emotions, but they never tell the truth in a regression. Uh, that, you know, whether it's past life regression, whether it's an alien abduction regression, these things Fancy. are never ever recommended to recover memories from you know something that's that's not proven i mean you can re sometimes recover childhood memories but then you run the risk of implanting memories through your own you know through your the suggestion and then you end up with a satanic panic mm. so you know hypnosis is a very very touchy careful type of thing and no real hypnotherapist would be doing those kinds of things um with with any amount of ethics involved no ethical. so yeah it's, well, it's not you know because they were taught during their training not to do this now this and was they go ahead and do it anyway because they're making some money like i guess 85 86 when it was actually 86 would have been when most of this was going on mm -hmm. so this is also not too far away from the whole satanic panic uh michelle remembers yeah. all that yes. sort of stuff so yeah. yeah this was uh this was kind of the golden age for suggestion uh, hypnotism messing your memories all kinds of ways of up so well i'd like to to show you a web there, there's a guy david m jacobs now he is a doctor david m jacobs so he is a doctor so you can feel good about getting your hypnotherapy from this doctor who has his doctorate in american history hey. um so <laughs> uh so like not in <laughs> not in uh, yeah it's not in psychology or psychiatry it's but in a he completely really unrelated the impression that he's a, a medical he, doctor he, yeah he really does tout that and he's um it, it's it's not right what he does uh so i, I want to show you two quick little pieces here the effects of hypnotism especially memories retrieved during hypnosis or hypnotic regression abduction memories are highly suspect. Paranormal <laughs> investigator Matthew Baxter is also a hypnotist. You learn very quickly that when you regress somebody, uh, they, they just tell what's in their imagination. Uh, they make up stories. They're very real to them, but they make up stories. Studies have repeatedly shown that hypnosis does not improve memory but it can create false memories and solidify a person's belief in those memories. For skeptics, it's no coincidence that UFO abduction stories began showing up in the therapy-crazed 80s, along with other hypnosis-related phenomena like satanic ritual abuse and multiple personality disorder.
all based on hypnotically retrieved memories. The problem I mean, here, here's David, is the evidence for all this. It's hard to think of weaker evidence. It is human memory. It is recalled through hypnosis with all its attendant problems. It is administered by amateurs like me. And then comes this anecdotal information. It's the bottom of the pile of evidence, but it is evidence. Now, I find that to be incredibly painful. I find that to be incredibly painful that he admits how terrible it is, how wrong it is, how it's administered by uh, you know amateurs. And uh, hypnosis administered by amateurs is incredibly dangerous, as we know. And then he goes, but it is evidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, th that's like... To me, that's that's practically criminal. You know, he's he's telling everybody it's okay what I do, and so I, I want to show you and a, a legitimizing little, it. Yeah, yeah. So I want to show you a little more clearly what he does. Um, this is from his website. Now, uh, Karen and I actually went through this uh, the other night. Um, so you know, I've it's the the questionnaire. Yes. Now I've had. Uh, a bit of a um, uh, UFO, a couple of UFO uh, and alien abduction experiences when I was younger, and I was a victim of the hypnotherapy craze. And so my memories I know are not accurate. And I, I have a, a tape recording somewhere of the session. I can't, of course, find it. Isn't that convenient? Uh, but I can't find it. But I remember listening back and going, oh, my God, she led me the entire way. And uh, you can just read through these. Have you ever seen a UFO? Not. Can you tell me about, you know, <laughs> can you tell me anything about why you're here? You know, what, what you think you've experienced. The he goes right to, have you ever seen a UFO? So there it's planted. Boom. Okay. We'll give a short description of the events surrounding the sightings. Um, as a child or an adult, did you ever experience odd periods of time and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, Karen was able to go through this and say, yes, to a lot of these and which led to oh you've been abducted you have been abducted get it get it signed up to have a session with me basically right. um and uh, these are terrible questions you know uh, if you're a woman have you ever felt certain mm -hmm. that you were pregnant but the pregnancy suddenly disappeared how regular or common are miscarriages you're really dealing with the pain that somebody's yeah. going through with a miscarriage and turning it into, well, maybe this wasn't a miscarriage. Evidence, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and and it's like, this is, and, and I, I had a screaming match with him about this very questionnaire 10 years ago, and it's identical and nothing has changed uh, in this questionnaire. And it, it is, this it, is very, I, I think it's very criminal. harmful stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it really is. And, and this is what, what basically happened to Whitley. You know, Whitley, uh, he may be, you know, uh, riding this this cash bandwagon that he's on, uh, uh, being addicted to people treating him like a god and all these things. But I also think he's a victim of uh, the, the hypnotherapy of the 80s. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, so. it's, I, I think, uh, you know, it sounds like from his interviews that, you know, his finances have taking a dive after that whole South Park incident, if that's true. It'd be interesting if to If you know. can be undermined by South Park, um, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. always been fairly good evidence that maybe you're not standing on completely solid ground. Now, what does that say about North Korea then? I don't understand <laughs> what you're saying. So, like, so, <laughs> I rest my case. But, <laughs> so I, I, I was well, thinking here about the, uh, well, I, just, I, I was just thinking about how he's always played this sort of coy game, like, rolling around the edges of he wants to make money off the ufo people the alien people but also keep himself into the new age stuff and not really lock mm -hmm. himself into any particular explanation look i'm going to tell you some mysterious oh. stories these are very scary things will come into my house to get me and like they're not killing me they're giving me some wisdom what's the wisdom i can't tell you what the wisdom is are they aliens i can't <laughs> yeah. tell you if they're aliens but just keep buying yeah. my books because i'm going to keep yeah. writing them 
You yeah, know, like, from okay. what you're saying, it seems like uh, because he's taken this hit from South Park that he's just really moving into an area that he thinks is is more vague, more ambiguous, and yeah. and uh, more appealing to people today. Moving away from religion into New Age spirituality. I would say though, of all his books, uh, while Communion is clearly the one most people think of with Strieber. He also co-wrote a book with uh, Art Bell called The Coming Global Superstorm. And oh. that was about this idea that global warming would actually cause a global ice age. And the documentary they made about that um, was so compelling. Um, it's called uh, The Day After Tomorrow. And, yes. uh, and know, it's a great it's, documentary. It's, yeah, It is really a good documentary. I like it a lot. Me and my son <laughs> love that movie. So. Uh, it's, 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 especially the I, lifelike I, the lifelike wolves the lifelike wolves are astonishing i mean i would say except for maybe wolfen maybe the best on-screen depiction of uh wolves in new york uh yes. yeah and uh you know just it's very it's a chilling uh plausible <laughs> ex explanation for how we'll end up uh if uh our, we don't get control of our weather a little better yeah i had so, forgotten um, that he had a hand in that he um, does yeah so. yeah so and, and and what you know just because of a lot of the the cool effects in the movie not the wolves but the rest of the cool effects in the movie i did love that movie as well um but yeah amazing. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it was fun to watch all of the scientists kind of come out and go no you know after that movie was released it's a good double feature with the thing if you're doing one of those things where i like mm. freeze out the house and uh i've done like a lot of double features on that like uh uh uh, I Station Zero, uh, doing both versions of the Howard Hawks version and the uh, the, the Carpenter version, but throwing in uh, the day after tomorrow is tremendous. Yeah, it's really good. So, don't you wish no, that so the thing was based on a true story? I would love to. I would love to have an episode on it. Is what I'm saying. It, 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 oh, I see. I thought, I thought. How is it not? I thought it was based on a true story. Or, are you not one of the body? Are you not one of the body? It's like, no, I'm, it's not <laughs> a true story. It's complete fiction. Trust oh, me, it's fiction. Yeah. I did want to just mention that I think it's interesting that uh, Eric Clapton composed the, the score for Communion. Oh, yeah, and yeah. The music was very prominent throughout, this uh, kind of eerie guitar riffs and uh, but I didn't know that he'd written the theme to that until I, I found that out today. And I think that's really cool. So maybe we can play a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. And that it was a uh, coke cocaine. Was that the one? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Crossroads. <laughs> I think, uh, I think it's very ecologically. Uh, Light room. Save, save the whales. It's uh, in the way like, that you whale! use it. Yeah. yeah. There is a lot of whale songs. There's a lot of whaling. Yeah. Uh, it's of its time. Yeah. <laughs> it is it, it is really uh i mean for a movie about uh aliens and rectal probes it, it's a <laughs> surprisingly uh porn music classic here so yeah so, yeah it's, yeah we'll, it's written we'll, uh, the blurb for the movie yeah. Like, uh, uh, yeah, actually, we don't mean to if you actually have had anal probes from aliens we don't mean to diminish your experience i don't that's not no, what this is about you got to take them as, on a case-by-case -case basis really exactly yeah. you know it's it's not something you just throw a big blanket over and say they're all fake because no. uh, you know yeah. you don't know you don't Leave know your stories in the comments <laughs> yes <laughs> why well, have the Either aliens way. got yeah. all this technology but haven't developed ky these are all really good mm -hmm. questions <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep or a way to look uh, inside the human body without a probe um, where's the fun in yeah. that matthew or some, some anesthetic that, or so. something you know <laughs> that's right knock me out aesthetic yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh speaking of youtube Ouch. uh please do subscribe to this channel we've got a lot of new content that's coming through with matt's ask a paranormal investigator and also our uh wants to talk live episodes we're doing another one of those soon yes hit that uh, like button so smash the like button everybody smash it smash it <laughs> crush it <laughs> algorithms and such uh, and uh, please do support our work through Patreon. If you can become a patron, we really appreciate that uh, support for all of our research and uh, all of the, the things that we're doing. And so if you like Are what you... we do, you'll... Um, thank you so much for, for joining this uh, episode. Uh, but before we go though, before we go, mm -hmm. um, do, do we want to uh, talk about what we're gonna do next time on Debased on a True Story or Dotes as we like to call it? 
Mm. Yeah, well, I think we were talking about uh, child's, child's play. play. Child's Chucky play. Chucky and, and looking at uh, Robert the doll. And mm. then uh, what was after that? We were talking about uh, Shining. Shining, yeah, Shining. Shining. Yeah, Poltergeist. Um, Lots oh, more you. shows coming up. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. And, and, if, so and if, you guys, if you guys have good ideas, put them in the comments and we'll, we'll look yes. at those, uh, those ideas as well. So, yeah, we right. love hearing ideas and taking suggestions. And, and again, thank you for, for joining us and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Okay, see you guys later.